Otis. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. President. Um, just a moment. I'm not sure your mic is working. It's not. Oh, it is now? Yes, Thank I you. think you're right now. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham and Ruston to the questions asked by Labor senators. Well, I doubt that the Prime Minister wanted to spend this week talking about the accusations that were aired in the Four Corners report on Monday night or in the papers today. In political life, however, you only have control over a certain number of things. You do not control the issues you face, but you do control how you respond. The Prime Minister had a choice to stand up and exercise moral authority or to crouch down and try and duck the issue, to be big or to be small. And in his press conference yesterday, the Prime Minister sadly chose the latter. The Prime Minister's comments sought to minimise and downplay the stories that have been told about the actions of ministers in his government. We heard that these were examples of human frailty, that we are all accountable for our own behaviour. What we didn't hear was a recognition of the bravery of the women who, sp who spoke up or a recognition of the importance of the parliament being a safe environment for everyone who works here or a recognition of our capacity to improve the culture of this place. And the Prime Minister suggested that these were all matters from the past and so there was nothing further required from him. Yet can anyone believe that the issues about puerile backstabbing from male party members raised by Liberal women in the WhatsApp group are in the past. I note that only last month other prominent Liberals are again calling for the Liberals to account for their failure to pre-select women. This is a chance to show leadership, and to date the Prime Minister has not taken up that chance. No one can pretend that poor behaviour is exclusively the preserve of members of one party. But the examples that are in the public conversation today relate to the Prime Minister's own party. And that gives the Prime Minister even more capacity to exercise moral authority, to listen to women and to recognise the harm caused by cultures of bullying, harassment or sexism. Those cultures diminish the institutions that we are all here to protect. The Prime Minister has been willing to speak on accusations of improper conduct made against members of other parties or coalition partners. The greater test is how, he is willing, how willing he is to respond to accusations made against those in his own party. This parliament has an opportunity to work in a bipartisan way to make this workplace better. And no matter what side of politics you are on, we can surely agree that staff working here should feel safe and supported. The accusations of bullying that have been made today add to existing complaints about culture that have been put on the record in recent years by Liberal women. And they are serious complaints. Because if we want this parliament to truly embody the democratic ideals that I do believe every senator in this place seeks to uphold, then this parliament must be a place where women can work and contribute free from discrimination. Women's work should be valued on its own terms. It shouldn't be assessed. Women should not be assessed by how they look or how they behave. It is their contribution at work that should matter. And in considering the issues that have been raised, I do believe we need to retain focus on women and their right to participate fully in this place. There are other issues that have been raised over the course of the week. Adherence to family values, the potential for compromise or blackmail, the reputation of the office. And these are relevant factors. 
But we cannot lose sight of the core obligation that we hold to the women who work here. Everyone deserves a safe workplace. This should be the primary matter of concern. And we owe it to ourselves, to this institution and to the people we represent to work together to ensure that that is how this place operates. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you. I rise to take note of, the, um, of this matter. Uh, I'm incredibly proud to be a part of a party that has sent four of the five senators uh, to this place that are women. Uh, I'm proud of that because we've been pre-selected and elected on the basis of being the best people for the job, not on any other um, attributes. So when we talk now about uh, safety and uh, uh, workplace conditions, um, I quite agree that this should be applied to all people in the workplace, that this is not uh, applicable just to women or just to men. This is applicable to all people who work in all workplaces, and we are all responsible in that way, whether it be as men who hold positions of responsibility or, indeed, as women who hold positions of responsibility. And building that culture in a way that uh, makes us all enjoy where we are and able to contribute uh, in a fulsome, matter, uh, fulsome way is important. I think the Prime Minister has been very clear on this matter, that he has a very strong ministerial staff code of conduct and that he holds both his ministers and all staff in this place to that high standard. Uh, I want to quote from the Prime Minister that where he says it is important that everyone should feel safe in their workplace, that everyone should have proper channels through which they can deal with any issue about which they are uncomfortable. I think that is incredibly important, and I think the change in ministerial standards introduced by my predecessor were important. What is important is that there are standards, and the standards are adhered to. And under my administration, under my government, I take that code very seriously, and my ministers are in no doubt about what my expectations are of them. Absolutely no doubt about my expectations, and I expect them to be lived up to. I think that is the issue that we are talking about, is setting uh, standards, setting a code of conduct and moving forward in that spirit, uh, to have matters raised and then be discussed in this place um, and act like a kangaroo court is a very dangerous place and one that I'm sure no man or woman would like to see our reputations and our uh, actions examined without it being with some due process and with some due consideration. Um, I have been uh, pleased to see comments from Senator Ron Boswell around the Australian flag and the introduction of that into this Senate. Uh, it is incredibly important that we are able to unite in our agreement of um, uh, what it is that unifies us, what brings us together. And the Australian flag as the official flag of this country is an important element of that. Uh, others, uh, it was referred to uh, by Senator McCarthy, are symbols, whether it be the symbol of the poppy that we wear today for Remembrance Day or symbols of uh, other flags, whether they be uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag um, state flags are all important flags, but it is the Australian flag which is the official flag which flies uh, both over this parliament um, and in the House of Representatives and in this, the Senate chamber. And it is important to find those things that unify us, those things that we can unite underneath, particularly in this time where people are searching for safety and security for some sense of certainty in the world when we are faced with a pandemic, both uh, with a health crisis and an economic crisis. So it is with much uh, pride that I reflect on Senator Boswell's comments, uh, again, uh, somebody from the National Party who has provided uh, much leadership and uh, um, thought around issues that are important to regional and rural Australia. 
Uh, he has not been well of late, and it, I'm very pleased to see that he is making a terrific recovery um, because he has provided uh, many years of incredible service and distinction um, both to the party and to the Senate uh, and to the country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I rise to take note of answers given by uh, Senator Rushton this afternoon. Senator Rushton papers over the incredibly difficult situation that job seekers in Australia find themselves in with now yet another cut to the coronavirus supplement. It's been reduced again uh, from its uh, 500 to now to 250 uh, to a level of $150 a fortnight, another cut of $100. And yet still this government does not commit to a permanent increase to the job seeker payment, which for a long time has been seen to be manifestly inadequate and way, way below the poverty line. The minister also failed uh, in the question to even acknowledge the prediction that there will be 1.8 million people reliant on JobSeeker by Christmas. That figure is currently at about 1.7, and therefore we can see that it is set to rise. But perhaps even more telling, more telling is the minister's failure to acknowledge the absolute disproportionate ratio of the number of unemployed people and underemployed people in our nation compared to the number uh, of jobs available. The minister simply said, oh, well, it's too hard. There are too many different ways of measuring it. Well, however you measure it, the outcome is bad. There are about 1.7 million people in Australia seeking more work. There are about 926,000 uh, totally unemployed people. There are uh, about um, one, the, the ratio of unemployed uh, people to vacancies therefore looks to be about one vacancy for every eight people. One for every eight people. And if you look at the feedback from people who are applying for entry level jobs, the ratio is much worse. Uh, there was one example of a woman who applied for a job in retail to find that she was competing with 790 other applicants. These are extraordinary uh, statistics by any measure, any measure at all. If we look to uh, other measures, it's, it's worse indeed for young people. It's much worse uh, for young people, uh, whereby they are subject to much higher uh, levels of unemployment, uh, where you can't get a job uh, as a young person because there are more than eight uh, young people for every vacancy. And let's just have a look at where we've come in this regard. <clears throat> In January, uh, Business Insider had these statistics as three, um, three jobs, sorry, three unemployed people for every one job. In October, they had it as five unemployed people for every single job. But what, what Business Insider doesn't do is does not actually look at the real unemployment rate. So when the government says the unemployment rate uh, is higher or lower, it's not actually, it doesn't count people who are doing some work. 
It doesn't count people who are doing some work. So in those October figures uh, from Business Insider, it's five people for every one job. But we know the levels of unemployment are actually much higher because there are 1.8 million people who are looking for more work in our nation. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Carr. Oops, beg your pardon, Senator Scar. I do admire Senator Carr very much, uh, uh, Deputy President. Not to, <laughs> I, I, he's a nice guy, Senator Smith. Uh, can I uh, deal with the matters which were raised by Senator McAllister? And I do have uh, a very high regard for Senator McAllister, and I am not going to question the sincerity of the matters which she raised today, the sincerity with which she raised them. But let me just say this. Uh, as someone who, in, uh, in, a, in a previous life before coming to this place, who had professional responsibility for investigating claims of sexual harassment or bullying in the workplace, who was responsible for enforcing codes of conduct and dealing with extraordinarily delicate issues. I am firmly of the view, firmly of the view, that such matters should not, in the first instance, be ventilated in the public domain, certainly not on television. I am firmly of the view that uh, appropriate procedures of investigation of serious response to complaints raised and pursuit of complaints should occur in the first instance in private. And I say this primarily due to the issue of respect. It is respect for the complainant. It is respect for the person who is subject to the complaint and it is respect for their families it is respect for their families for their children and for everyone close to them these can be extraordinarily delicate matters typically are highly personal and have complicated backgrounds and i think it diminishes this place diminishes this place for those matters to be canvassed prior to an appropriate investigation taking place. It shows a lack of respect to the individuals involved, it shows a lack of respect to their families, and it shows a lack of respect to due process. And I say that as someone who believes passionately that all individuals have a right to a safe workplace where they are free of sexual harassment, where they are free of workplace bullying, where they are free of discrimination. In the event, in the event that matters are raised privately and they are not given sufficient serious attention, in that event, but only after such processes have occurred, then I think relevant parties have a right to blow the whistle, to raise issues and say, I raised a complaint behind closed doors. I'm not happy with the seriousness with which it was investigated, and on that basis I'm elevating it in good faith. And we've seen some episodes in corporate Australia recently where aggrieved complainants have taken those steps of going public, of blowing the whistle, and there have been consequences for some leaders in corporate Australia as a result of that whistle being blown. And in my view, it was entirely fit and proper that that whistle was blown and that those consequences flowed from the complaints which were not adequately or appropriately dealt with. But I think it is incumbent upon all of us 
to respect due process and to respect the legitimate expectation of everyone involved in such personal matters that their rights, including to privacy, will be dealt with with, with respect and with sober deliberation so that matters where they can possibly be considered in private, confidenti confidentially, giving respect to all parties involved, including their families and including their children, I think that is what we should all aspire to. Thank you, Senator Scar. As Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of my question to Minister Birmingham on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags. And I, I do note uh, within the numerous questions and uh, supplementaries that I asked, one of the things that I did notice, uh, Madam Deputy President, was the question around the Australian citizenship test which includes a section on Australia's flags, the Australian flag, the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag. And there really did not appear to be a substantial response to that. And I think it is very curious, uh, Madam Deputy President, that uh, people who move to Australia and are asked to sit this citizenship test uh, have it pointed out to them the importance of these flags. Uh, not just the Australian flag, but the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Island flags. And even today, on this most uh, sacred day in terms of Remembrance Day, where we stop at 11 o'clock to remember those who fought for our country, I spoke about it earlier, uh, the importance of First Nations, black diggers, as they're called in terms of the marches here on Anzac Day, but also uh, in terms of the work of the Australian War Memorial and its recognition. And I must point out that that was actually under the previous uh, director, uh, Dr Brendan Nelson. And I commend the work that he's done, along with others who've worked there, such as squadron leader now Gary Oakley, uh, who has worked at the War, Australian War Museum as an Indigenous Liaison Officer. And the importance of uh, that institution, Madam Deputy President, in bringing about and reconciling the significance of First Nations uh, soldiers, uh, men and women, over, over centuries, really, in terms of defending Australia, not just externally in terms of uh, other countries, but also internally with the frontier wars. So, so symbolism is important, and that question of the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags and the citizenship test uh, shows that this government obviously sees it as important. So to uh, then ask uh, the minister the question around Liberal governments in New South Wales, Tasmania and soon South Australia uh, flying the uh, Aboriginal flag in their parliament, and would the minister reconsider uh, the motion here before the Senate in relation to that symbol of respect? for First Nations people, especially this particular week, uh, Madam Deputy President. I mean, this motion was actually put to the Senate in August. Uh, it's not something that just came up because of NAIDOC week. It's actually something that uh, was prolonged and has now resulted in being put forward in NAIDOC week, uh, simply because we were being respectful and urging the government to have the dialogue and have the discussion, but instead the prolonging of it meant uh, clearly that it was not a priority. And I'd like to point out to Madam Deputy President that the minister didn't respond to that question about whether the motion would and could be reconsidered here in the Senate, even though those parliaments, those Liberal parliaments in New South Wales, Tasmania and soon South Australia will be all flying uh, the Aboriginal flag in their parliament. And I think that's really telling, especially uh, uh, telling in the, in the point of view that this is the federal parliament, this is the, uh, the parliament of the people, the Australian people, and if there's ever an opportunity to say, hey, uh, maybe we need to reconsider this, then I think that would be an incredibly generous and gracious thing for this Senate to do, uh, in this week in particular of NAIDOC, to send the right message 
the right message of unity, of bringing First Nations people and non-Indigenous people together over something as symbolic and sacred as the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Island flag. As Senator Pat Dodson said, uh, there are 44 flags flying out the front—44 flags. And most of them are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. So, Madam Deputy President, uh, I certainly call on the Senate and I call on the minister who didn't answer these supplementary questions to reconsider supporting this motion and putting it back into the Senate to fly the First Nations flags. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. Those of that answer. Start again. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. I rise to take note of the question I asked, um, the answer um, by Minister Rustin um, to the question I asked about the job seeker payment. Well, here we go again. The government refusing to actually commit to not dropping the job seeker payment back to forty dollars a week a day sorry forty dollars a day they know that that payment is too low they know that because they very sensibly put in place the coronavirus supplement as people started to lose their work earlier this year they knew that people couldn't survive on it they knew that families couldn't survive on it, so they increased it. But now, now they're slowly taking away supports before the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic is over. While we're in recession, they're cutting away those supports, going back to their old way of doing business, which is to demonise and punish those that can't find work, despite the fact that there's 12 people looking for every for every one job vacancy that there is they would not commit to the fact that they won't drop it back to forty dollars a week and the minister trotted out the usual tropes and the usual comments of oh, you oh people get a whole range of other payments the point being even with those payments they're living below the poverty line and the majority of people that are on income support the main payment they get is the energy supplement of a grand four bucks a week well that doesn't even buy you a cup of coffee not that if you're living on that you can afford a cup of coffee i just did a quick check of the rents as they are at the moment just in perth and perth isn't the highest uh, the, the city with the highest medium rent in Perth, it's, it's $395 a week. At most, if you're getting Commonwealth rent assistance, which about only half of people on income support get, you get $185 a week. So you can see that that is nowhere near actually covering the cost of rent. Nor could the government answer. In fact, Senator Polly um, asked a question around this issue, around the reduction in the value of the coronavirus supplement come the end of December to $150 a fortnight. There's no justification for how they came to that, co to that level of funding. There's apparently no consideration of the fact that come January people will be living further below the poverty line, and if you're lucky, you might get um, some level of rent assistance. But if you're one of the majority, you'll get your extra four dollars a week, still putting you significantly below the poverty line. There is no way we are out of the woods yet in terms of employment. We know the government's own figures are predicting that there'll be 1.8 million people unemployed. This country already has around three million people living below the poverty line. You would have thought that the government would realise that it's much better to have people coming out of the recovery with enough money in their pocket to feed themselves, to provide for the services that 
and the supports to overcome the barriers to employment, because as I've said on many occasions, the government doesn't seem to be paying attention. Poverty is a barrier to employment. They keep running out the line that there's plenty of jobs out there. There are not plenty of jobs out there, and certainly not from the people that I'm hearing from, from across Australia, in fact, around the fact that they are trying to find work and they can't find work. Now, I also asked during uh, my, one of my supplementaries was about whether people who have accessed their super, whether that is part of the liquid assets that count towards the liquid asset liquid asset waiting period. And yes, it is. So if you've drawn down your super to help pay your bills, and in the instance that I've got an email about just yesterday was in fact to help uh, start uh, a small business, and that small business unfortunately hasn't been going real well during the coronavirus period and the pandemic, and so the particular person has had to reapply for JobSeeker. That person had, in fact, got themselves off the payment to help run their business, uh, to run their little business, but unfortunately is not able to make ends meet and has had to reapply for JobSeeker. And guess what's happened? Because that person used the only bit of superannuation that they have, that has meant that they aren't able to go back on the JobSeeker payment because the person's got a little bit of cash there. So instead of supporting that person, that person now has to run down their only bit of superannuation that they've drawn down to try and make their lives better. What does this lot do? Makes them wait. Not only have they stuffed up the application, not getting back to this person, they're also now making them wait till the day before Christmas before they can go into the job seeker payment, wearing down their superannuation payment. That is a farcical, ridiculous situation. And then when that person does actually get onto the job seeker payment, they'll get the much reduced coronavirus supplement of $100 a fortnight. Happy Christmas, folks. Happy Christmas. Because I know that those people that are looking down the barrel of getting another reduction in the payment they get they're not going to be having a very good Christmas when they know what's coming on the 1st of January. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawood be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.